If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, we have been going through this amazing gospel and we find ourselves really in the middle. We just looked last Lord's Day at the feeding of the 4,000 and this incredible miracle. And off of the heels of that, in Mark chapter 8, verse 11, Mark tells us this. The Pharisees came out and began to argue with Jesus, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. And they, the disciples, had forgotten to take bread. They did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving orders to them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? And they said to him, 12. When I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? Do we understand? These are the words of our gracious and holy God, but in order to understand them, we need him to open our eyes. So let's ask his blessing on our time this morning, and then we'll dive right in. God, thank you for the promise that you made so long ago that you would send your Holy Spirit so that we could see that he would open our eyes, not only to see our need for a savior, not only to enable us to be born again, to regenerate our hearts, to create in us a heart that loves Jesus, but also to encourage us and to help us and to open our eyes. Even now, we need the Spirit's help. So Holy Spirit, as we do every Lord's Day, we pray, we plead with you, open our eyes that we would behold wonderful things from your law. If you do not do that work of illuminating our understanding, we will be like the disciples. We will see but not see. We will hear but not understand. So Father, be pleased by your Holy Spirit to show us Christ so that we could see him clearly today. We pray in the precious, matchless, holy name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Mark chapter 8, verses 11 and following are really all about spiritual blindness. And we will see two of the aspects of spiritual blindness. We're going to save the third for next Lord's Day. We're going to see the blindness of the Pharisees and the blindness of the disciples. And then as we get to the blindness of the disciples, that's where I want to hunker down. You can kind of see it here, even in the ink that's spilled. There's a little bit on the Pharisees. There's a lot on the disciples. Let's first look at the blindness of the Pharisees. Verse 11, after the feeding of the 4,000, the Pharisees come out and began to argue with Jesus, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. That word for seek, most often in the gospel of Mark is not a good word. It's a word that's seeking for the purpose of something bad. It's arguing against somebody and seeking a way to prove them wrong. That's why Mark includes they're seeking from him, but they're arguing with him. They're coming out to argue with him. They're seeking a sign from heaven. That word sign is another, similar to the word seek, the word sign in the synoptic gospels is not primarily a good word. It's primarily a bad sign. The gospel of John, the word sign is a good thing. It's good signs that Jesus is doing to point us to who he is. But here they're looking for a sign. And that word almost always carries a negative connotation in the synoptic gospels. 
They're looking for a sign because they want to argue with him and they want to test him. And that Greek word for testing is more like harass. They want to harass him. So here's what's happening in verse 11. It's, it's not like the disciples or the Pharisees are not aware of the miracles Jesus had done or they hadn't seen the miracles that Jesus had done. But their physical seeing of those miracles was not enough to produce spiritual sight. The signs that Jesus had already done are no good if you have no eyes to see them. The Pharisees are asking for a sign, but they're asking for something that they won't even be able to see. And they're asking from a wrong motive, from a wrong heart. They want to prove that Jesus isn't who he claims to be. In essence, what they're saying is our minds are already made up about who you are. We do not believe that you are the Messiah. And we have already proven that by telling you that we think that you're doing the miracles you're doing by the power of the devil. And so we're going to demand a sign to prove to the crowds around you once and for all, you are not who you claim to be. To demand a sign reveals a precondition of stubborn disbelief. People who demand signs like this never believe even when the signs do come. But notice what happens with the Pharisees here. When you don't want something to be true, then you can't clearly see the evidence that proves it is true. If you don't want it to be true, then you will not believe even when the evidence is clearly presented. And that's why Jesus responds in verse 12 by sighing. For a second time in two chapters, Jesus is sighing. He's sighing because of their hardness of heart. It's a holy exasperation with their sin. And it's also why he responds by saying, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. They've already been given more than enough evidence to believe. One more sign won't do it. It won't convince them. They're not going to be given a sign because they're going to reject that sign. In essence, it's as if Jesus is saying, if you cannot already see the work of God in me through what I've done, then no amount of evidence will convince you otherwise. Your demand is just an expression of your unbelief, and I'm not playing that game. He knows it's not a genuine question. And so he says, I'm not going to give you any sign. Whoever comes to Jesus... He will not turn you away. But if you come with arrogance of heart, you're not going to get anything from the Bible. If you come arrogantly to the scriptures, you're not going to get anything. He's not going to turn you away, but you're not going to get anything. Jesus is more than willing to cater to your intellect. If you have questions, ask. But he is unwilling to pander to your arrogance. And so he says, no sign will be given to you. Matthew chapter 15, the parallel passage, he says, no sign, but the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah that he was buried, if you will, in the fish for three days and three nights. So too, the Son of Man will be buried in the heart of the earth and then will rise from the dead. As one commentator says, Jesus will provide no noisy sign from heaven in the way that they are wanting, Only the wind whistling through an empty tomb after his crucifixion. And even then, the Pharisees won't believe. They won't believe because they can't see. And they can't see because their hearts are hardened. I know we look at the Pharisees and we say, we don't want to be like them. And Lord willing, we are not like them. But unfortunately, in our arrogance, we are more like them than we care to admit. And we have spiritual blindness as well. There are things that we can't see and we demand of God to do something so that we can see. And God says, I'm not gonna do that. Don't come arrogantly to the Lord, come humbly, even as that Syrophoenician woman did. So we see the blindness of the Pharisees and Jesus leaves them, verse 13, on the move again, goes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, just constantly back and forth, across the sea. And that brings us to verse 14, which is the blindness of the disciples. The blindness of the Pharisees, a stubbornness of heart that enables them to not be able to see and perceive when they should be able to, if they had humble hearts to receive. We come to the blindness of the disciples, and I I love this section. This is one of my favorite sections in the Gospel of Mark, because number one, I see myself in these disciples. Number two, 
what Jesus says is so simple and yet so profound. And that's why we're going to take the remainder of our time on this section alone, diving into their blindness. Verse 14 says they had forgotten to take bread. They didn't have more than one loaf in the boat with them. So they're in the boat. They're going across the sea and they don't have more than one loaf. Maybe even that one loaf of bread is mostly gone at this point because they've eaten it. You can just see the disciples in this boat. You can just hear them talking to one another. Peter saying, Andrew, I thought I told you to get all the leftovers that Jesus provided. All those seven huge baskets full of food. We wouldn't have to go searching for food or buy food for a very long time. Who forgot the baskets? And Andrew's saying, it wasn't me. I told Judas to get it. And Judas says, it's not me. It's somebody just constantly moving around and arguing and struggling and fighting and bickering. And in the midst of it all, Verse 15, Jesus cuts through and says, watch out, be on your guard, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Leaven is that yeast that's added to the bread dough to make it rise. And Jesus is saying that the Pharisees have a yeast and Herod has a yeast and you need to beware of it. But when the disciples hear yeast, they hear bread. And so verse 16, they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. They look around and they think, well, who would have been dumb enough to buy bread from the Pharisees? The Pharisees don't own a bakery. They don't sell bread. Who bought bread from the Pharisees? Jesus said, beware of it. Don't eat it. They probably poisoned it. They hate us. So don't eat the Pharisees' bread. And Peter again goes, Nobody bought bread from the Pharisees. We had one loaf, and even that's almost gone. Somebody says, yeah, but Jesus also said, beware of the bread of the Herodians. Who bought bread from Herod? There's so much bread talk happening here. What's going on with all the bread? And somebody says, why are we talking about bread? There's no bread in this boat anymore. What are we talking about? You can see the confusion on their faces. You can hear the confusion in their voices. And they look at Jesus What are you saying, Jesus? They're only thinking about physical bread. And if there's one thing that they don't ever need to worry about, it's physical bread because Jesus makes it out of nowhere. They don't see the real issue. They don't see what Jesus is trying to say. There's a depth to what Jesus is trying to say that they don't get. And Jesus knows that. That's why in verses 17 through 21, he's going to ask them a series of questions. He's aware of this. He's aware that they can't figure this out. They don't know what they're supposed to see and they don't see it. And so he says, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? You know, Peter might've said, because you just told us to be aware of bread. We don't have bread that we should be aware of. What are you talking about? Jesus says, do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Can't you just picture one of the disciples going, wait, how did we get from bread to hardened heart? What are we talking about here? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they all say 12. We remember that, Jesus, of course. That was an amazing miracle. And then Jesus says, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said, seven. And Peter says, and no one forgot or remember to bring them on the boat. Thank you very much, Andrew. And Jesus, after asking all of those questions, says to them, do you not yet understand? Just picture this conversation in your minds, in the boat. They're all hanging out. They're all talking. Jesus says, beware of the bread of the Pharisees and of Herod. They say, we have no bread. Why are we supposed to be aware of bread and be uh, concerned for this dangerous bread? What's so dangerous about it? We don't even have it, Jesus. And Jesus goes, hey guys, do you remember the first feeding miracle that that I did? How much leftover did you have? And they say, oh, we remember. You had 12 baskets given to us. And then he says, do you remember the second feeding miracle for the 4,000? How many baskets left over? And they say, oh, we remember seven. And then he looks at them and goes, don't you get it? And I think they go, nope. (laughs) Get what? What are we supposed to get? They don't understand. 
Jesus is trying to connect them to the spiritual reality of what those miracles were supposed to show them. We talked about this last Lord's Day. They missed the spiritual significance of what those miracles were conveying. They were showing that Jesus is more than enough to satisfy you. You don't have to go anywhere else to be satisfied. Go to Jesus and he has more than enough to satisfy you. He's making a plea here through what he's asking for the disciples to be satisfied in him alone and in his overflowing abundance. Again, just like the Syrophoenician woman had said, I just need a crumb, overflow the abundance to me. I just need a crumb of your glory and that's all that I need. Jesus is telling his disciples through these questions, all that you need, you can find in me. Jesus's compassion plus Jesus's power equals everything that you need. But as he asks them, don't you get it? They say no. Matthew 16 tells us that the disciples knew that he was talking about the teaching of the Pharisees, not their bread. So somebody says, okay, he's not talking about physical bread. He's talking about be on guard for the dangerous teachings of the Pharisees. But they're still fuzzy about the depth of what Jesus is trying to communicate. So what I want to do is I want to ask three questions in our remaining time that hopefully, Lord willing, will take us deeper into the heart of what Jesus was trying to say. What the disciples were supposed to get, but they weren't getting. Three questions. Question number one, what are the leavens? What's the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod? What are these leavens? How can we define them clearly? Question number two, what makes them so dangerous? Why does Jesus say, watch out and be on your guard? And question number three, what is the remedy against this danger? What's the remedy for it? If we are to be on guard for it, then how do we protect ourselves? What's the remedy? What's the solution? What are the leavens? What makes them so dangerous? And what's the solution? Question number one, what are these leavens? Again, Matthew 16 tells us, that these disciples understand the leaven of the Pharisees to be their teaching. That's correct. Luke chapter 12, the other parallel passage, says the disciples understood the leaven to be the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. But can we go deeper than just their teaching and their hypocrisy? I think we can. And I think we can, knowing that what Jesus is going to do here is connect the Pharisees and the Herodians. He's going to connect, beware of the bread of the Pharisees and beware of the bread of Herod. They go together. There's something about them that's connected. So what's the leaven of the Pharisees? Well, the last time that Jesus interacted with the Pharisees, they are determined in their unbelief. They will not believe anything that Jesus does or says, and they do not like Jesus. Why? In the whole of the Gospel of Mark, Every other encounter that Jesus has had with the Pharisees has always been over Jesus and the disciples not keeping the Pharisees' rules. Remember that at the very beginning. Why do your disciples not fast? They're supposed to fast like we fast. They're not keeping our law. Why do they pick the heads of grain on the Sabbath? They're not allowed to do that. Why do you heal on the Sabbath in our synagogue? You're not allowed to do that. Why do you wash? Why, why don't you wash your hands? You're unclean. You're ceremonially unclean. Why don't you keep our laws? That's why they hate Jesus. And that takes us into the common thread that helps us define what the leaven of the Pharisees is. Leaven. It's what makes the dough rise. It's it's a bread, it's a source of satisfaction. So Jesus is saying, beware of what satisfies the Pharisees, what they love, what they enjoy being satisfied by. So what is it that Pharisees love the most and they enjoy being satisfied the most by? What is it? It's their self-righteousness. It's their pride in their own ability to cleanse themselves. I don't need Jesus to save me. I need Jesus to politically save me, but I don't need him to spiritually save me. I can cleanse myself, thank you very much. They are not satisfied in Christ. They're satisfied in their own rules. So if we can define it with one word, the leaven of the Pharisees is legalism. The leaven of the Pharisees is legalism. It's a joy and a satisfaction 
and I have rules and I keep my rules and I'm satisfied in who I am, I'm an awesome person. Just remember the, the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. The Pharisee says, God, thank you that you didn't make me like that guy. Thank you, you made me who I am. I wouldn't want to be anybody else because I'm awesome. What satisfies them the most is their self-righteousness because of their own ability to keep their own man-made rules defined in one word, it's legalism. But Jesus doesn't stop with them. He also mentions the Herodians. What's their leaven and how is it connected? Well, again, in the context of the book of Mark, when was the last time that we saw the Herodians? The last time that we saw Herod was that crazy story with John the Baptist, where Herod Antipas had divorced his wife, married his half-niece, the daughter of his half-brother Aristobulus, who had married, uh, was married to Philip, who was another half-brother of Antipas, that messed up family tree, so convoluted that I had to show it on a slide. That's the last time that we saw the Herodians. So what are the Herodians most satisfied in? What brings them the most joy? It's not keeping rules, it's disobeying all of them. I just want my sin, and I don't want you to tell me that I'm wrong. You remember, that's why Herodias wanted John the Baptist beheaded. Don't tell me that I'm wrong. Let me live in my sin. Let me live in what I want to live in. Don't tell me that there's rules. Don't tell me that I can't do it. The Herodians want to live how they want to live. They want their power. They're a political oppressor. They want their power, and they want to live how they want to live. They don't want to be told they're wrong. They're most satisfied in their sin, so what is the leaven of the Herodians? If you wanted to define it in one word, and we'll use another L word since we're talking about leaven, the Pharisees, it's legalism. The Herodians, it's licentiousness. Licentiousness, live it up in your sin. Do whatever you want to do. There is no such thing as morality. Just do what makes you happy. It's a hedonism. If you want the theological term for this, it's antinomianism, anti against uh, nomian, namos, the Greek word for law, against the law. No law. Antinomianism says there's no law. It's the opposite of legalism. Legalism says there's all these laws that you must keep. Antinomianism says there are no laws that you need to keep. And that's why Jesus says, beware of both of these leavens. You have legalism, strict rule following, and you have licentiousness, rule breaking. And Jesus says, beware of both. So why? We've defined it. Number one, what is the leaven of the Pharisees? What is the leaven of the Herodians? We have definitions now. We can boil it down simply to say legalism and licentiousness. But the second question is, why is it so dangerous? Jesus says, watch out, verse 15. Beware. This is something that's serious. Why? It's in the word leaven. Leaven is that yeast. You add it to the bread and the dough rises. And a tiny little amount makes a huge difference. And most often in the New Testament, the word leaven is used negatively. A negative connotation for a heart attitude, a heart posture. You have the leaven of pride or malice or wickedness or false teaching. It's a small thing that can have a massive effect and subtly grows. Leaven is a cancer. It's a tiny amount that can destroy you. So we need to be on guard because of how pervasive of an impact it can have in your life and how cancerous it is. But more than that, what does it do once it grabs hold? It will shift your source of satisfaction away from the Savior. Instead of going to Him, and him alone to be satisfied. He, the living bread, all that we need, we go to something else. Instead of coming to him alone when he says, eat my flesh, drink my blood, or else you have no part in the kingdom of heaven, be satisfied in me alone. That's the invitation he's giving. Come to me alone for satisfaction. And these two leavens will subtly shift the source of satisfaction to something else. So Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 11 to 13 are so important. If you want to turn there, you can. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11, when God is bringing a charge against Israel, telling them that you are committing idolatry, you're going after other gods that don't even satisfy, they don't even help, they don't even answer and respond. Jeremiah 2, verse 11 
God calls all of heaven to come into court with him and sit in judgment against Israel. He says, has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? Not even the nations do this. Not even the pagan nations change their gods and turn away from their gods. They're more loyal to their false gods than you, Israel, are loyal to the true God. But he says, my people have changed or exchanged their glory for that which does not profit. So be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder and be very desolate, declares the Lord, because my people, verse 13, have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. That's evil number one. They've gone after another source. They've forsaken me. They've left me. And number two, they've hewn for themselves cisterns. And these are broken cisterns that can't even hold water. These are broken cisterns where you would store water. It was a very bad way to store water. Uh, Animals could get into it. They would drink from the top and fall in. They'd drown and you have this contaminated water. It's a terrible source of water. And this is a broken cistern, so it's leaking through. It's broken at the bottom and mud's coming in. It's just disgusting. You put a cup into that cistern and bring it out. It's not going to be crystal clear, beautiful water. And yet Israel says, you know what? Instead of going to the fountain of living water that's refreshing and satisfying every single time we drink, we're going to go to broken cisterns. That's in essence what Jesus is saying here in Mark chapter 8. Don't go after the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod. Don't go to other bread to be satisfied. That's evil. That's the essence of the very first temptation in the Garden of Eden. God says, you can eat from anything in this garden. There's one tree you can't eat from. And Satan says, has God really said? He wants to keep the best things from you. Don't be satisfied in what he has to offer. Be satisfied in the very thing that he says don't go to. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, he's terrified that the Corinthians will be tempted by the craftiness of the serpent to wander away from simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't let these leavens tempt you away from simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus. In essence, what Jesus is saying in Mark chapter 8 is you will be tempted to stray from being satisfied by me alone. And two of those greatest areas are going to be legalism and licentiousness. If you ever move away from Jesus as your sole satisfaction, you will either turn to being satisfied by your good works or being satisfied by your bad works. And so he says, watch out. Our first question, what are these leavens? The leaven of the Pharisees is legalism. The leaven of Herod is licentiousness. Second question, why is it so dangerous? Why is this leaven so dangerous? If I can put it in a a little phrase, it's so dangerous because it subtly shifts your source of satisfaction away from the Savior. It subtly shifts. It's subtle. It's yeast. It's so small, but a tiny bit has such a massive effect. It's subtle, and it shifts. It's not an instant overnight. It shifts as it slowly grows, subtly grows, and it shifts your source of satisfaction. Instead of going to Jesus for living bread and for full satisfaction, you're going to something else. Subtly shifts your source of satisfaction away from the Savior. So question number three, what's the remedy then? What's the remedy? Jesus says, beware of these leavens, but he doesn't really give us an explicit remedy. It's there, but he doesn't give us an explicit remedy. What's the remedy against legalism? Being satisfied by your own righteousness, being satisfied by your own good works, ability to keep laws. What's the remedy against licentiousness? Just living for yourself, living for your own pleasures and hedonism. Many people often believe that the best way to fight against those positions is to get a little bit of the other position. If you're a legalist, you're just too focused on rules. So learn from the licentious people. Don't go all the way to their camp, but learn from them and chill out on your rules a little bit. Come to the middle. Or if you're an antinomian, you don't like laws, you don't like rules, learn from the legalists and come to the middle a little bit. 
You just need to come to the center. Learn from the other side and come to the center. You might be tempted to believe that's the remedy for legalism and licentiousness, but that would misunderstand the heart of legalism and the heart of antinomianism, though they might look exactly opposite. They're actually identical on the inside. They're identical. The religious leaders and the political leaders, the Pharisees and the Herodians, have the exact same heart. And I believe the best place in the Bible to see this is in the story of the prodigal son. So go there just really quickly. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. You remember this parable. The longest of all of the parables that Jesus taught. Probably the most well-known, most beloved parable. You have the younger brother and the older brother. You have the younger brother who at the beginning of the story says to his dad, dad, I wish you were dead. That's what he's saying in essence. I want my inheritance now. The only way I would normally get it is if you died. You're no good to me unless you're dead. And so I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance now and I want to leave. I don't like you. I like your stuff. Give me your stuff so I can get away from you. When the father says here, Gives him his portion of the inheritance. He goes away to the distant country, to the far country, squanders it all. You remember the story. Finds himself in the pigsty, in uh, the, trying to eat the slop with the pigs. Realizes how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough to eat. I can't even eat this pig slop. So he gets up, verse 18. This is Luke 15, verse 18. I'm going to get up, I'm going to go to my father, I'm going to say to him, Father... I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. I love those three statements that this younger brother would have been saying. I'm sure all the way as he's walking home in his filth. And he's saying, repeating over and over, Dad, this is the speech he's going to tell his father. I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And you remember when he gets almost to home, the father has been watching and waiting and longing for him to return. He sees him at a great distance far away and goes running down the road, embraces him, hugs him, kisses him. Verse 21, the son says, rehearsing that speech, Father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight. That's absolutely true. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's absolutely true. But notice verse 22, the father cuts off that last statement. The father calls his slaves and says, bring the best robe quickly, put it on him. That third statement was, treat me as one of your hired men. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, so let me work for you. Let me serve you. I can just live in your property and work and I'll earn my way into that household. I I can't be your son anymore, but I'll earn my way in your household. But we can't earn our way into God's grace. We can't earn our way into God's favor. And that's why the father cuts him off. He won't even let him say that last sentence because that sentence won't work. And they celebrate. But you know, this parable is really about the older brother because the Pharisees are the older brothers. Verse 25, the older son is in the field and when he comes and approaches the house, he hears music and dancing. Pharisees are the older brother. Pharisees are legalists. The older brother is a legalist. Legalists are usually suspicious people, especially when they encounter joyful people. If you're happy, you shouldn't be happy. And he hears music and dancing. I think he knows exactly what's already happened. He won't even ask his dad, verse 26. He will summon a servant and inquire what these things could be. And the servant says, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. And he becomes angry, not even willing to go in. And his father comes out to him. By the way, this is a very helpful hint that the younger brother and the older brother are more alike than we would think. Because the father came out and chased down the younger brother. He was the forwarder to that meeting. He was the one running down the path to greet his younger son. And so too here in verse 28, the father is the one who has to come out to meet the older brother. The younger brother's far off, the father seeks him out. The older brother's far off, the father seeks him out. But the older brother says, verse 29, look, 
That's never a good way to speak to parents. <laughs> never a good way to start your sentence. I'm sure that we'll talk about that in our parenting seminar. Next, uh, next Lord's Day, we'll start with uh, what kids should not say to their parents. This is one of them. Don't ever start a sentence, children, with look. For so many years, I've been serving you. My Bible says serving you. The translation could literally be, I've been a slave for you. I've been your slave. It's the Greek word doulos. I've been slaving away for you. I've been your slave. Again, this is a typical legalist mentality. Everything I do, I have to do. I do it because I have to do it. I don't want to do any of this. I'm a slave. You have forced your will upon me. I don't want it. He doesn't even see himself as the father's son. He sees himself as a slave. I've never neglected a command of yours, middle of verse 29. That's the way legalists see themselves. I've never broken a command. This is a ridiculous claim, similar to the rich young ruler who says, all these things I've kept from my youth, what do I still lack? I've obeyed the law perfectly. How could someone so thoroughly miserable with such a bad attitude here, even in this section, insist that they're perfect and without need of repentance, such as the blindness and self-deception of sin, Legalists are really good at lying to themselves. They tell themselves they're really good and they don't neglect God's commands. Sinful hearts have an amazing capacity for self-deception. But notice, he says, I've kept every command of yours, and yet, it's very interesting. This son sees himself as his father's slave. I've just been slaving for you, and I've done it perfectly. My question is, why didn't you leave? Why didn't you leave if that's the way you view yourself in your relationship with your dad? Well, he tells us, I stuck around, I've done all these things, and yet you've never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my what? With my friends. See, dad, I don't really like you. I just like your stuff. I like my friends more than I like you, and I want to take your stuff and go be with my friends. I don't want to be with you. There are two types of people in the world. There's younger brothers, there's older brothers. There's Herodians, younger brothers. There's Pharisees, older brothers. Younger brothers, prodigals, they're just out and out rebellious. Their sin is obvious. But older brothers are just as evil and just as wicked, if not more so, but their wickedness takes a different form. The elder brother is not losing the father's love in spite of his goodness, but rather because of his goodness. It's not his sins that create the barrier between him and his father. Rather, it is his pride that he has this perfect moral record. It's not his wrongdoing, but his righteousness that's keeping him from sharing in the feast of the father. That's why I say, The leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod at the heart are identical. These two brothers, though they look absolutely opposite, are identical in their sin. Why? What did the younger brother want most in life? I just want your stuff, Dad. Don't want you. And I want to leave with your stuff. What did the older brother want? I just want your stuff, Dad. Don't want you. And I want to leave with your stuff. Celebrate with my friends. They both wanted the exact same thing. They just went about it in completely different ways. The older brother wanted the father's things instead of the father, but the older brother's way of getting those things was to stay close to the father instead of leaving to go to the far country. Each one wanted to get into a position in which they could tell the father what he had to do. Each one rebelled. One did so by being very bad, And the other rebelled by being very good. Both are alienated and lost. This is why Jesus says, beware of these two sides of the same coin. They look exactly opposite. Legalism and licentiousness. But beware because the heart is the same. You can rebel against God and be alienated from him either by breaking his rules like the Herodians do. We don't really care about your laws. We don't care about your rules. We're going to do whatever we want to do. Or you can rebel against God and be alienated from him like the Pharisees by trying to keep every single law in the book. I don't know about you, but this is a shocking message. 
careful obedience to God's law could serve as a strategy for rebelling against God. Why? Because if you believe I'm going to keep God's law so that I cleanse myself and I'm good enough, then you have no need for Jesus. He is not your savior. And you can stiff arm him and push him away and say, I am my own savior. You see, the Herodians say, I have no need for Jesus because I don't think I'm doing anything wrong. I want to live it up in my sin. I don't even think there's a category for sin. I just want to enjoy my life. I don't need saving. And the Pharisees say, yeah, we don't need saving either because we can do it ourselves. We can do it ourselves. That's exactly what the Pharisees had done. That's why they keep on butting heads with Jesus. The religious leaders had developed that system, that religious system with 613 laws. And they chose that number very specifically. Why? That's how many separate letters are in the text containing the Ten Commandments. There are 613 letters that make up the Ten Commandments, 613 Hebrew letters that make up the Ten Commandments. And so they said, we're going to have a law for every single letter. And they divided them into do's and don'ts. 248 do's, one for every part of the human body as they understood it. 365 don'ts, one for every day of the year. They love their laws. Why did they love their laws so much? Because they believed that if they followed them, they could say they were blameless and they had no need for a savior. Older brothers obey God to get things. They don't obey God to get God to love him, to resemble him, to know him, to delight in him. It's just obey God to get his stuff. And that is not salvation. Legalism begins to manifest itself in incredible ways in our lives when we see God's law as a contract with conditions to be fulfilled and not as implications of a beautiful covenant graciously given to us. Legalism and antinomianism are more than just doctrinal issues. They also show themselves behaviorally too. A legalistic spirit is marked by jealousy, oversensitivity, harshness towards others' mistakes, ungenerous default mode in decision-making, getting angry when things go wrong for you, judging yourself as much better than others and thereby passing strict judgment on others, finding it hard to forgive. These are all symptoms of a pharisaical heart, a heart that has been already subtly shifted by the leaven of the Pharisees. Antinomianism presents itself as well, obviously in a love for sin, but also in a divorce of duty and delight. Instead of finding your greatest joy in Christ, you find it in sin, and therefore you go through the motions of duty even though your heart is so far away from God. Therefore, the heart of legalism and antinomianism is the same. They're not opposites. They are, as Sinclair Ferguson calls them, quote, non-identical twins from the same womb. And if we're honest, we we know that. Sometimes I live out the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod in the same day, almost in the same hour. I'll, I'll get impatient with my kids. I'll blow up with anger towards them. Totally Herodian. The leaven of the Herods has infected my soul and I just want what I want. I know it's not right, but I want what I want now. I'm angry and I want to have control and I lash out and it's wrong and it's sin. And then sometimes the leaven of the Pharisees gets right into my soul in that very moment as I go to my kids and I say, you need to forgive me. I messed up. Please, I'm so sorry. I sinned against heaven. I sinned in your eyes as well. I hurt you. I offended you. Please forgive me. And as we hug and they say, of course, dad, I forgive you. I walk away thinking I'm pretty good. That was probably the best uh, apology I've ever given. That was amazing. And now the leaven of the Pharisees has infected my soul such that I actually think I'm not that bad. Look at how well I kept that law. In the same 15 minute span. That's why Jesus says, Beware, it is so infectious and it's so small and subtle. So the remedy for legalism and antinomianism is not a little dose of the other. If the heart of both of those is identical, then you don't want a little bit of the other to balance it out. No, you need to shatter those categories altogether. 
Only the gospel saves you from these two non-identical twins. If I can say it this way, the remedy against the leaven of the Pharisees and the remedy against the leaven of Herod is gospel grace satisfying you in Jesus alone. This is the remedy, the only remedy. It's gospel grace satisfying you in Jesus Christ alone. Gospel grace alone satisfying you in Jesus alone. That's why Jesus says, I broke those pieces of bread and I gave overflowing abundance to satisfy you with all generosity. You do not have to look anywhere else. And you didn't get me to do that miracle. I graciously gave it to you. So it's grace being given and it's more than enough to satisfy. That's why Jesus goes back to the feeding miracles to say, that's the remedy. And that's why he says, don't you get it? He says to the disciples, don't you understand? There's the leaven of the Pharisees. There's the leaven of Herod. You're seeking to be satisfied by both of those. And it's a temptation and it subtly shifts your source of satisfaction away from the Savior. But I have given you grace and I have given more than enough to you. You don't have to go anywhere else. That's the whole point of what he's saying in Mark chapter 8. Only the gospel changes your heart to enable you to love Jesus like this. Where once you spurned Jesus and loved your sin... Now you love Jesus and you hate your sin. Do you hate your sin? Maybe you're here this morning and you would honestly and willingly admit, you know, I do have the leaven of Herod in my soul. I love sin. I love living in sin. John Owen is so helpful here because he says the root of our sinful behavior is an inability to hate sin for itself, not for its consequences. And he says, this stems from a tendency to see obedience as a simple way to avoid danger and have a good life, not as a way to love and know Jesus for who he is. Do you hate sin? Or do you just not live in it because you don't like its consequences? Not because living in sin will keep you from seeing the face of Christ. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full The leaven of Herod keeps you from looking full because you've got sin staining your sight. Are you a Pharisee at heart? Do you have the leaven of the Pharisees? You are moralistic, you're legalistic. Only grace can show you that doesn't work, nor does it satisfy. I love the way that Augustus Toplady, the author of the hymn Rock of Ages, speaks of grace. He says, when the citadel of the human heart is taken by grace. The enemy's colors are displaced. Satan's usurped authority is superseded and the standard of the cross is erected on the walls and the spiritual rebel takes the vow of willing allegiance to Christ, his rightful sovereign. From the moment of conversion, grace introduces a total change. The renewed sinner abhors himself as in dust and ashes, for all that he has done and can never sufficiently adore, admire, and revere that infinite goodness which, instead of turning him into hell, has turned him to God and made him a living monument, not of deserved vengeance, but of unmerited mercy. Only the gospel can change your heart to own that you are helpless and hopeless to cleanse yourself. I love the way that uh, one author says it in speaking of the the reason why we need to share this message of grace with all the people around us, even as we sang earlier in that hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, and how the world is starving for this, and we're starving for grace. He says, in a world powered by works and measured by achievements, there is something deeply refreshing about the unmerited transforming favor of God-given grace. Without regard to the worth of the recipient, rebellious wastrels return home to red carpet welcomes. Work, workers in the vineyard receive far more than they ever deserve. Tax collectors and sinners enter ahead of Pharisees and Bible teachers. Last minute converts enter paradise on the same terms as everybody else. The message is entirely pitched at those whose works do not measure up, could never measure up. He ends by saying, as preachers never tire of pointing out, there is a chasm of difference between the last words of the Buddha, his last words were strive with earnestness, and the dying words of Christ, who said, it is finished. It's done. I paid it in full. 
So my friend, if you have ever felt like you don't measure up, like you haven't done enough, there's a burden weighing you down and you're wondering, what more do I need to do? I'm not enough and I need to do more. I want to encourage you. The question is not, have you done enough? Have I done enough to earn heaven? Have I done enough to earn God's favor? Have I done enough to make him love me? No. Anyone with any sort of self-awareness will, will realize we haven't done enough and we couldn't do enough. The real question is, has Jesus done enough? And the answer is so clear in the scripture. It is finished. He has done it all. He has done more than enough. And he willingly, graciously says, don't go anywhere else for salvation, for sanctification, for glorification, for satisfaction. Don't go anywhere else but to me. So Herodians at heart, stop your quest for satisfaction in your sin today and turn in repentance to Jesus and rest in his grace. And Pharisees at heart, glory with gratefulness in grace. Own that your goodness is never going to be good enough, but Jesus's goodness is all that you have ever needed. We'll never stop being Herodians and Pharisees until we acknowledge our need for salvation and rest by faith in his finished work, and gaze continually in wonder at Jesus Christ. But the story doesn't end there. Turn back to Mark 8, because I want to show you one last thing before we go to the Lord's Supper together. It's very tempting, whenever we see the disciples, to think, how dumb can these guys be? But oh, don't you see yourself in this boat? Don't you hear your voice? Don't you see your face? Jesus could just as easily said to us, say it to us, do you still not understand? And yet in the midst of this correcting, I want you to see there is hope even in the midst of this correcting that Jesus gives. Because in verse 17 and in verse 21, Jesus gives us a glimmer of gracious hope when he says, do you not yet understand? There is so much hope in that word yet. They don't get it yet, but they will down the road. At the end of this chapter, they're going to get it. And then their vision will be blurry again, but they will get it. So do you have an expectation that you will see as you press into the scriptures, as you press into God's grace, that at some point your eyes will be opened? All the signs in the world will not help you if you don't have sight. And I plead with you, do not miss out on seeing Jesus by living in legalism or licentiousness. But there is hope that by his grace alone, you will yet understand, see, and perceive. Father, we thank you so much for the grace that you've given, that there is hope even in our confusion. There is hope even in our lostness whether it's completely lost as unregenerate sinners or whether it's struggling in sanctification to find satisfaction in you and so often running to something else to be satisfied. There's hope. We might not understand now, but we will. Only as we press into your grace with all humility of heart. So Father, I pray even now as we partake of communion and we do so with gratitude and humility that we would receive the grace that you have to offer in Christ and that we would be satisfied by him alone in this very moment as we humble ourselves in his presence. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.